There we go. Good evening. Hello, we'll just let everyone jump on here. We'll have quite a few on tonight. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to disappear for a little bit and finish my snack. I just wanted to get started. I just don't want to eat in front of everybody. So I'll be back. No problem. Sounds good. This is not working. I can't hear. Well, we can hear you, Perlene. I can't see you, but I can hear you. It's not even. Just in case. It said I'm not. Where is it? It says email. Sign in with Google. I can't get a sound on here. I can hear you, Pearlie. I just told her that too. I'm like, we can hear her. She can't hear us. What is that? <laughs> Melissa and Sarah, we can hear you. Oh, you can? Mm, yep, we can. But you can't see? Yeah. Oh, I'm all over the place. Okay. Let's see. I'm trying to close these little boxes down here. They won't move. Oops, there I go. Lost with you. We live well enough alone. Where are you cancel? Okay. Now, um, you can you see me? Not yet. That's the problem I'm having. Okay. You're on a Let's see. computer? Yeah, I'm on a computer. Bottom left hand, it should say start video. Okay. No. No, I lost you. Wait a minute. Let's see. Start. Okay. Seems like I lost your sound. Okay. Mute. Oh, we had video for a minute. I saw your no. ceiling. No, yep, it's, it's on. Video's okay. on. It's on. Yep, the video's on. It's just pointing at your ceiling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we go. There back. We go. Yep. You got it. There we go. There we go. There. There. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Gosh. All righty. Are we, um, do we need another, like, are we going on to um, another site to do the homework? I mean, how my notes? Same site has been for years, the Link Learn certification. Okay. And then the, um, tomorrow we will get into the practice lab with Mary Ann and doing an actual problem. Yeah, I was trying to figure out how, how you, you know, Multitask. You call it, open up another window and still see you to get to the site. Yeah. Back to the learn site. Where my books. My desk is so small. Oh, I'm over here. You seen the organized chaos behind me? I see your little workstation. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. How many volunteers do we have tonight? Not sure how many we'll have tonight. The students um, that we have, college students, are going to do a separate training. We're recording this for them so they can review it. Um, because they come back to school a little later than usual. So I'm guessing we'll have, we might have up to 20 on this training. Okay, sounds good. I have a question while we're waiting. Go ahead. Okay, um, I went through the intake interview test and the, the other one too, the conduct test. conduct test today. Um, and on question number five for the first intake interview, it talked about, um, Oh, uh, I got to remember how the wording went. Um, oh, photo IDs. Uh, were they required for everybody? And I said yes, and they, they said no, but it referred me to uh, 5101, page 26, which didn't have anything to do with photo IDs, but I did find it on page... Um, Found it on page six, I think it was. I didn't write that down, I'm sorry. But it said, it's a good idea to get a photo ID to prevent photo, you know, I mean, um, ID theft and that sort of thing. So the way we've been doing it for years is um, if you are a signature on the form, so me and my husband need photo IDs. We need um, social security cards for both of us and all the kids. Right. Uh, that's just it's it's probably more stringent than it needs to be. Um, but that being said, uh, there's a reason our our accuracy rates are so high. There's a reason why our uh, rates of, um, you know, people not coming back and that sort of thing. We're we're able to be very efficient in that manner. And I think uh, for the most part, a majority of our taxpayers understand that that's happening. Um, you know, from the get-go that we're going to be um, requiring that. Now, that being said, I've been doing this in the Quad Cities now. Boy, this is my seventh year, I think. Um, I've been involved in VITA since 2007. Um, so there are some people that I do know, but that being said, um, you know, we, there, it's, in some places they've said, well, you know, um, if they do it once uh, and we've got them in the system already, you know, do we really need a photo ID? It's just easier across the board to just say to everybody, no, everybody needs a photo ID. We need to know who you are and that sort of thing just across our, because we're, we have to uh, live by the rules of both VITA and AARP. And I'll get into that a little bit in, in just a little bit. Um, we do the same services. Um, but, and we wanna make sure that we are on the same page with everybody. So generally speaking, everybody needs a photo ID um, and we need social security cards for every single person that's on the, on the uh, um, tax return. Thank you. Right, Perlene? That's right, absolutely. <laughs> no exception. You bend, your, bend the rule, then the rest I'm here and they wanna do it, so yeah. Okay, if we know them, we need that. They know it. <laughs> and I think that might have started like just because AARP, I think, requires it. We don't necessarily require it, but since we work in tandem with them so well in this area and we um, use a lot of the same training resources and um, other resources, it, it just makes sense to go by the stricter uh, rules. Yeah, that's your due diligence anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Well, good evening, everybody. We'll wait about a minute or two minutes here and we'll get started. I'm Melissa. I'm the one who's been sending you all of those fun emails. So I'll uh, introduce myself and our presenter tonight here in just a moment. And do want to let you know we are recording this um, because we have some college students that are not back in session with class yet who will be referencing um, some of the topics tonight too. So just a heads up that it is being recorded and we'll just give it another minute here for some more people to log in. <clears throat> Melissa, I completely forgot today. My kids left for hockey five minutes ago. I was like, oh my gosh, it's Monday. <laughs> Ugh. But they got where they needed to go, right? Oh, yeah. Oh. I mean, they're hitchhiking to get there, so hopefully they get there, but... <laughs> I've been working all afternoon to get this clean and clearly it looks like I didn't make a dent in it. <laughs> you probably work from home anyway, right? I, I went in for the first time. I worked all day on Friday at the center. That's oh. the first time since St. Patrick's Day. Wow. Okay. okay. So, but yeah, with keeping the kids at home and with my husband's job, um, he, uh, they had a couple hundred cases there at one point and it just, it was easier to just leave me at home and working remotely completely, um, yeah, since March. Yeah. yeah. That's, the, that's the new normal working from home. <laughs> mm hmm Okay, it is 532, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Melissa Giesing. I'm with United Way and, of the Quad Cities, and I'm the coordinator uh, for United Way with the VITA program. We also partner with AARP throughout the Quad Cities, and we'll be officially uh, announcing all of our VITA locations and times tomorrow. Uh, so just putting the finishing touches on that. So by the time we meet tomorrow night, I'll email you with that information. And so tonight, Sarah Belkovic, uh, a longtime uh, VITA person with us, involved in various capacities since 2007, is going to be our presenter. Um, before she presents uh, the training for tonight, I uh, just want to let you know that if you still need to pick up your uh, volunteer packet, I will be at the United Way office tomorrow between 2.30 and 4.30. Um, unfortunately, you can't just swing by any time because we're all working remotely, but I did carve out a couple hours there where I don't have meetings elsewhere. Um, so I'll be there from 2.30 to 4.30 tomorrow if you still need to pick up your packet. And um, also tonight, we just asked while Sarah's presenting that you put yourself on mute. And then um, if you have questions, you can type those in the chat box. We may or may not have time at the end for you to, you know, ask questions face to face, unmute yourself. So please do use that chat box just in case we do run out of time because I'll collect those questions and we'll start going through those um, near the end of our time or I'll hold those over for tomorrow. So um, appreciate all of you joining in and uh, dedicating your time toward this great cause. So with that, I will turn it over to Sarah. Well, thank you so much. Um, as she said, my name is Sarah Balkovic. Um, my first year, I started as a volunteer. Um, so I was in your shoes. Um, I did volunteer work at the, um, I did, whoops. <laughs> hey, Allison, I think you're, you're uh, sharing your screen. <laughs> 
Um, I did volunteer work at the uh, in the basement of the library in South Bend, Indiana. I went to uh, school and undergrad at uh, St. Mary's College up at um, the girls' school at uh, Notre Dame. So um, yeah, that's how I started. I very humble beginnings, and then um, I got a job after college and moved around and after a couple of years um you know Way contacted me and they asked they had seen that vita was on my vita volunteer experience was on my resume and they said do you want to come in as a site coordinator and um so i accepted that and that was that was four kids ago uh so um all of my kids have come up through our different sites and that sort of thing uh but that was this will be my eighth year, I think, seventh or eighth year uh, doing taxes with Quad City Vita. Uh, if we want to go around real quick and just if the site coordinators could uh, wave and say hi, just so they know who you are. Um, and then if you guys feel like jumping in at any point where I'm missing something, please let me know. Um, John, do you want to go first? You're on mute. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Sound like a commercial, doesn't it? Uh, I'll be the site coordinator basically on the Iowa side of the river, uh, working out of uh, the Friendly House and, I don't know, possibly one or two other locations. We haven't got everything 100% uh, nailed down yet, but uh, you want to do some Iowa returns, come on over and I'll get you started. <laughs> Uh, Steve? I've also been working here. I've also been working with Vita for a number of years. I think this is my eighth or ninth year with Vita. So I love the program. I uh, put forth the effort, do everything I can to, to uh, help it grow and help it develop. And hopefully uh, I can continue on for a few decades longer. Awesome. Steve? You're on mute too. <laughs> You're still on mute. <laughs> on mute. Okay, there we go. Hello, um, I'm Steve Emmy. Um, I'm not a site coordinator, but uh, basically a um, usually a quality reviewer. Um, but anyway, I think this is if this is John's eighth or ninth year, it's my seventh or eighth year. Um, and um, have worked mostly at the Friendly House, but filled in at uh, several other places on both sides of the river. Um, but uh, anyway, it's a good program, um, and uh, really appreciate being able to help people uh, with their taxes. And taxes are, you know, way too complicated even at the basic level. But so I'm glad to be able to help people uh, get what they have coming back. Get what they have coming, really, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Perlene. I'll be back um, oh. Wednesday night um, for the uh, Iowa taxes that John talked yes. about. <laughs> Thank you for that, too. I appreciate that. Perlene? Uh, there we go. I'm Perlene, and I, along with Allison, work at the Martin Luther King Center tax site. I've believe I've been doing it about eight years, probably three years with the economic progress. Um, it's getting easier and better as the years go because we're a walk-in site and it's much it much flows better when it, we do it that way. But with this pandemic, we got to figure out how we're going to do it this year. And I'm looking forward to it because it's a great, great um, tool for to help out the low-income people. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to starting it up at the end of this month. I believe it's January 28th, I believe, we're starting. Something like that. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Allison? Hopefully, I unmuted. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm Allison, and I've been doing this for about 27 years or so. Um since I was at Augustana College. So come see Perlene and I at Martin Luther King Center. Um, we work well together and we're hoping that we have a good year. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, so 
you know, this is first and foremost, we want to say thank you. Thank you so, so much for donating your time and your efforts. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways you could spend your time. Um, I know, you know, time is a finite resource. I'm so glad that um, you guys are willing to share that time with us. Uh, this is a program that the IRS has put into place um, through volunteers, uh, like community volunteers such as yourselves, as well as students from different colleges. That's where I got my start. Um, this is a program that is desperately needed in this area. Um, I think two years ago, the stats were we did 6,800 tax returns uh, with the partnership between AARP and United Way. The average income this is the middle. So half the people made slightly more than this, half the people made less than this, but the average income was $20,000 for a family, which is absolutely, you know, I, I think about what, what my family makes and, um, you know, we are just so fortunate in this area that we have such a um, strong volunteer coalition that is able to jump in with both feet and really help to uh, really change the lives of some of these people. Um, you know, some of the tax returns that we're doing, if you qualify for earned income credit, um, some of these national companies out there will charge quite a bit of money per form to uh, file those for you when they've done not even, you know, no extra work on their end, but if they see that a family is getting back, you know, two thousand, three thousand dollars, they can say, "Well, we can take a couple hundred dollars of that." Um, you know, that couple hundred dollars <laughs> could be the difference between um, putting gas in the tank or making sure that people have food on the table and that sort of thing. So this is a very desperately needed um, service in the Quad Cities, and I don't see any um, any well, with the pandemic, it's been hard to expand, but you know, it's, I could make, we can make money doing taxes, you know, anywhere this time of year. Um, that being said though, there is such a need for people to, um, to go to somebody that is trusted, um, that has no ulterior motives, uh, that just want to see them get the, um, best deal, you know, get what they have coming to them, get what they can get legally, um, that, you know, not leaving any money on the table for them that, you know, could go back into these pockets of these people, and especially with the pandemic. I mean, everybody knows, you know, you've got lost jobs and that sort of thing. And so it just, any way we're able to help and reinvest in the community, I think that makes us stronger as a whole. All right. <laughs> that being said, um, we are um, IRS certified tax volunteers. What that means is if you have not picked it up yet and it's not in a binder, uh, they, they give you a little ring. Actually, I might have my, yep. It's nice working from home. I can just pull out last year's. Uh, so <laughs> they give you a ring for this. Um, this is actually two years ago. Um, but for ease sake, I would say get yourself a one inch binder and uh, put your 4012 in there. Okay. The nice thing about being an IRS certified volunteer is A, you get this training from us. B, uh, with the VITA program, there are certain parameters we hit. And those parameters ensure that people have the most um, legally sound and accurate tax returns that they can possibly have. All right. And uh, what that means for you guys is um, we, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we've got these different parameters in place to make sure that um, our returns are as accurate as possible. One of those things is we have, you heard um, in our introduction, some people are site coordinators, some people are quality reviewers. Every single tax return is going to have at least two sets of eyes on it, going through the entire thing line by line to ensure 
that everything is as it should be, that there are no typos, that there that everybody's name is correct and spelled correctly, social security numbers are right. You write down that somebody had eighteen thousand dollars of income instead of eighty one thousand dollars because that could uh, make a difference on a tax return. <laughs> I'm sorry, sweetie, I'm teaching. <laughs> That's my youngest uh, quality reviewer there. Um, but that being said, every single tax return is going to go through this to make sure that we are on the up and up 100% of the time. Sorry, just a second. I'm so sorry. Anyway, uh, so. On the first page of your 4012, the 4012 is kind of a cheat sheet. It will have a lot of the information that you need for the different, um, any questions you have, dependents, incomes, who should file, um, different education credits. There's a nice little flow chart and cheat sheet in there for that as well. The very first page though, on the inside front cover, it says we're gonna um, volunteer standards of conduct. If for any reason a taxpayer were to sue, if you are staying within our parameters on what you have been trained for and what um, you have been certified to do, you are not yourself legally held liable for these returns. It comes back on the VITA program. All right, that being said, here are the rules. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have, um, we have to make sure we're following quality site requirements. What that is, that's these, uh, checks. Um, I'm going to go through in just a second and I am going to show you, um, we have a check-in form, um, and we should be able to email it out. It's form 1361-4C. Um, yep emailed the link to that this afternoon. So if you checked your email in the last few hours, that link was in there. You can refer to later if you need to. Perfect, thank you. So what this is, and I'll show you the physical copy. It is a, it'll show four pages on yours, but it is one big sheet, okay? And it is pretty exhaustive on what uh, could potentially be covered on a tax return and that sort of thing. So what we're going to do is um, when the taxpayer comes in, they are going to fill this out completely, every single time, every single taxpayer, every single time. I don't care if they have one, two, and that's it. I don't care if it's somebody's kid, and can we just do this real quick five minutes? No, every single person, every single time is going to fill this out in its entirety then you guys as the uh, preparers are going to go through this and there is an option um, on pages two and three. You can mark yes, no, or unsure. We are going to go through this with them and anytime they have an unsure, we're going to ask them about it. We're going to probe them about it. What exactly do you mean by this? Do you have a question about this? And that's when you start to get kind of the interesting, well, I just, you know, we sold mom's house and we're not sure if we have um, income from it and this and that. And that's when we're able to figure out precisely how we are going to um, frame that um, tax event and make sure it's most accurately return, um, presented on the tax return. Are there any questions on that? I've got a comment for you, Sarah. Sure. A lot of times when you're doing the return, you'll say, do you have any W-2s, any income? And they'll give you two or three W-2s and then you'll get those processed. Okay, any other income? And they'll give you another W-2 or two or a 1099-R. If you go through this return with the taxpayer and the line says income W-2s, you ask them if they have any, do you have any W-2s? and they'll give you two or three and you say, is this all of them? Put them face down on the table and you're gonna build a pile from the top down, so to speak, going through this, this income statement or this income form so that at the end, if you do it with every item on that income statement or the, that intake Inventory. Form, yep, 
you won't have any surprises at the end with them going, oh, by the way, is this something I should be giving you? If you go through it line by line on that intake, it alleviates all those surprises farther down the road. So you may look at it as, well, that it's just a waste of time to go through this form that they filled out. And then we have to ask them all these questions. It is a little bit longer on the front end, but you save a lot of time on the back end if you do that. Mm-hmm. Thank you, John. Uh, so that's one of our rules. Every single person does that form every single time. Um, as he said, you know, it helps us with the parameters. Um, if you've got that form in front of you, I can actually share my screen and pull it up. Um, and go to the actual form. I thought I had it up. So you'll see there, it says yes, no, we're unsure. So we're going to go through all of that income information and we're going to ask them questions on it and probe until we have a definite answer for every single question. Then we're gonna talk about expenses with them. We're going to talk about life events with them. We're going to talk about where they want their, um, their um, refund put if they're uh, owed a refund. Concerning money, um, we can't touch it. <laughs> that money is the taxpayers. Uh, if they do not have a bank account, they can go get one and uh, give us a call back and let us know what that bank account is. And we can put it in their personal account. We cannot put it in somebody else's account. If I am the taxpayer, I cannot say, oh, just deposit in my grandpa's account, it'll be fine. The IRS will track how many returns are going to which accounts and they will, uh, they will flag that as fraud. Um, it's a lot less heartache if we just make sure they all have their own bank accounts or they're receiving it in the form of a check. We are not allowed to have tip jars. We are, you know, if they, um, if people want to um, do that sort of thing, I mean, there's, I mean, it's just, it isn't, it isn't a thing. <laughs> we refuse any of that stuff. If you have any questions on that, please refer them to your tax, um, your site coordinator. Site coordinators have a lot of leeway as far as, uh, you know, we, we have the big shoulders, uh, especially John. And uh, <laughs> we can take any of the disgruntled people, we can take any of the happy people who want to give us money, we, we just can't accept any of that sort of thing. Um, general rules for our sites, uh, every single person needs to have a name tag. We will have that for you, we will prepare it for you. Um, so we will do that with you um, and then once we get through this interview process with this form, another thing that if you have questions, one big place people have questions is list the name of anyone who lived with you in the last year. You would assume that it would be anybody who was related to you, right? But we, we're gonna go through these uh, different things tomorrow on dependency and that sort of thing. And we will answer those questions for you a little more in detail. Marianne will talk about dependency and um, I might get into filing status tonight. I'm not sure. We'll see how far we get. Um, so after we do this tax review or this review, uh, stop sharing for now. Um, you will then have somebody come over and recheck the entire form. Every single, I will go through every single one of these questions and make sure they're all answered. I will make sure people's names are correct. I will make sure their phone numbers are correct. As I said, we make sure there's no fat finger problems, no typos, no, yeah, if you have a question on how something should be, you know, would it work better if we had a different education credit, for example? Should we list them as married filing separately versus married filing joint? Um, any of those questions, you know, you can bring those to your site coordinators if you have any questions ever whatsoever. You know, we always work very well with each other and um, two heads are better than one. And between that, you know, we will come to the most accurate, most legally sound um, answer to those questions. So after that, what happens is um, you guys will finish the return. We will go through it 
in, in normal times, what happens is we would come over, we would correct it, we would go through it line by line with that tax preparer. Ultimately, they sign off that they understand the entirety of their tax return, that they will be held responsible for it, that they are the ones that are presenting this information as true and accurate and complete. And then um, we, we being the site coordinators and quality reviewers are the ones who actually physically upload that to the IRS then. The site coordinators are also the ones that if anything, if there were any weird hiccups or anything like that, we deal with that on the back end as well. So does anybody have any questions on any of that portion thus far? No? Okay. So you've got the volunteer standards of conduct on the inside front cover of your thing. It says um, follow quite <clears throat> quality site requirements. We will not accept payments, solicit donations, accept refund payments, etc. Do not solicit business from taxpayers you assist. I'll, there are some uh, tax returns we are not allowed to do. Okay. Um, very, um, you know, the, the really annoying ones, <laughs> um, my, uh, personal return would not be on there. I have business income. I have rental income. I have a, um, household employee that I pay household taxes for there, These are a lot of very, very complicated things. When I print my tax return off, it's like 90 pages. We don't do those. Uh, <laughs> we, um, we do a majority of them, um, but what you can see is if you turn to page five um, on, your, on your 4012, and actually I could pull that up and share that as well. Um, 4012, and then we're going to go down to Zoom. Share. So on page five here, it's going to tell us scope of service. If it's in scope or out of scope. Again, you guys will not be personally held liable for these returns if you stay within this scope of service. We are allowed to cover people's wages. We are allowed to do interest, dividends, IRAs, and 1099Rs. Um, capital gains and losses, standard deductions, itemized deductions, uh, not in scope for qualified business income deduction. We're not in scope if their taxable income's over $163,000. Again, the average income of our people is about $20,000. You're going to see a lot of W-2s. You're going to see a lot of 1099Rs, which is retirement income and pension income. You're going to see a lot of, um, student loan interest deductions. You will see a lot of um, education credits. You will see a lot of child, uh, child care tax credits. And you will see, I'm trying to think, what are the, the other big ones? Those are, that's a majority of what we are going to see. You may see some um, purchases and um, disposal of um, stocks and bonds. We will show you how to do that. Um, we see uh, non-resident alien. So uh, some people will have tax returns that do not have social security numbers on them. They have I-10s. And uh, so we do handle that, especially at Palomares and Moline. Uh, we do uh, Puerto Rico returns, we don't get Puerto Rico returns here. And um, I'll show you in just a minute. We've got different levels of certification. So that'd be very specific. Um, we have gambling winnings. One thing we do need to talk about, um, and I'm sure on Wednesday, we'll get into this a little more in depth, but um, with gambling winnings, you need to figure out A, where they live and B, where they want it because <laughs> Um, everybody's got their hand out for gambling winning taxes. <laughs> uh, 
and we also very specifically to this year we need to figure out yeah there's your student loan interest deduction that is covered alternative minimum tax is not covered we won't see that though um, self-employed and simple and qualified plans we don't deal with that um, we don't do household employment taxes that's the one that that's one of the ones that kicks me out um, so they're you know very you will know if they are with within scope because um, if we are doing our jobs correctly they're filling this guy out and this guy is going to kick them out and we'll have we'll say sorry we are not that's completely out of scope and one of us on the management team will be able to tell them you know that's not something we are able to do at this place once we get to that point they say well then where do i go and i can't say legally well i do taxes on the side or my friend joe does taxes we can't do anything like that we cannot um, provide a list of preferred uh people that we work with or anything like that we i mean basically you know we've got a phone book so there's a lot of accountants out there there's a lot of tax here not provide any guidance beyond unfortunately we are not able to do this return on our own does anybody have any questions on that so far or does anybody any of the um Quality reviewers want to jump in with any other points on that? Hi, Sarah. This is Courtney Kydecker. Hi. Um, I I just I am the EICC site. Um, relatively new. This is my second year. Perfect. Um, so so it's interesting for me because none of this training. Um, we came to it late last year, so so we didn't do it. This is my first time being trained. Um, but if I, I think one of the important things um, about the the intake um, is is the you know that we're expecting people to show us their social security card. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that regular practitioners out in the world are not terribly used to doing because they see the same clients from year to year. Yep. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that we. Um, do so well in terms of preventing fraud is that um, we do need to see that. And, and may, I, I, sorry if I jumped the gun and said that before. Oh, no problem. You know, you were ready to say it. Um, and, and and that was new to me. But uh, you know, one of the people try very hard sometimes to get around that and say, you know, whatever. But basically, it's that. And I think is it the your social security um, uh, 1099G. Um, the, those are the two things that are acceptable to prove their identity. Yeah. Um, so um, we've we've had we want to see as many social security cards as we possibly can, um, because like Courtney said, um, we are some, we are at like something like ninety nine percent accuracy for this program. Uh, they figure out how many of them were kicked back and that sort of thing, and we're right up at the top, uh, even more so than a lot of the Vita sites even or. Um, and that's because we are so stringent on ensuring we can um, we can see those um, social security cards. You will so, and, have. And the, sorry, yeah, go ahead, the reason, Courtney. The reason that I bring that up is because th that is one of the circumstances. In addition to something that's out of scope, um, that that I at, at at our site we would refer people to the free file program. Um, which is sort of Vita's sister program um, mm -hmm. that allows people to do returns on their own um, using, you know, commercial software. Um, and I think the income limit this year, I want to say it's 72000 uh, for a household. Um, and, and some of the similar um, provisions that apply to us also apply to free file. Um, but for the most part, you can get um, a software choice that will let you prepare a return for free yourself um, using uh, the free file software. And, and, you know, so that's one of the places that I would refer folks to if their income is below the threshold uh, for free file and either they don't have a social security card with them um, and they can't find it um, or they're out of scope for some other reason. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, 
so that is that portion of it. Um, the next point that they want to talk about is um, not to solicit business from taxpayers who assist, not knowingly preparing false returns. Okay, so what happens if um, I, if John were to fill out a form, he heard that they made some cash income and that sort of thing and left it off the return. Um, and then I came in as site coordinator and checked it and did not hear this conversation about uh, cash income and that sort of thing. Uh, technically, John would be um, breaking the rules. Sorry to throw you under the bus, John. <laughs> okay. We do this a lot. <laughs> um, but I would be within my scope because I did not knowingly prepare that return, right? I did not know that there was cash income. John did know. And so John could potentially be held liable for a false tax return in that case. Oh, excuse me. So just keep everything on the up and up. If people mention things um, and you get them talking, that is good information. Take notes on it. That paper, this is not anything. I mean, it's very special to us. It provides a lot of information. But that being said, we can mark it up as much as we want. And I will go through as site coordinator. And if you have written some notes or if you have questions or if you want me to double check something, please make a mark and I will address it as I'm, and, and I say that on behalf of all of the site coordinators, we wanna make sure that these returns are done as uh, legally, uh, um, as legally and as um, accurately as possible, okay? Uh, taxes should not be a scary thing. Um, as I tell people, it's your yearly reconciliation with the government. There's some things you do where you get money. There's some things they do where they get money. And between the two of them, we're figuring out how much is in each column and we figure it out for the year end for you. Okay. Hey, um, Sarah, Sarah yes. going to the social security number discussion, we have a question. What about people on a work permit who may not have a social security number, what do we do with that situation? So uh, those people will have a letter and they will know. Um, and uh, they have a letter that says what their ITIN number is, which is, uh, I forget what that, taxpayer um, employer number or something like that. Um, but it is a, a full size letter. I'll see if I can bring one up. It's IT number. Not. I'm not pulling one up quickly, but uh, so they will have um, documentation though from the IRS that has that, that information on it. Other photo IDs people can use, um, passports, state IDs, uh, that sort of thing. Um, as somebody said, you know, in rare circumstances, if um, an older person doesn't have their um, social security card, um, if I've known somebody for years and years and years and years, um, those that have social security income uh, get a statement from the IRS or from the social security administration that has their number on it. And if it's got the full number on it, I have taken that in very, 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 very rare circumstances. But generally speaking across the board, have them find their social security card and bring it in, okay? Uh, Sarah, one thing, uh, when you mentioned the ITIN, uh, anybody who enters the United States without a social, you know, without being a resident of the United States, they, have access or they have the ability to file with the Social Security Administration and get an ITIN, which is basically a, a social security number substitute for non-residents. So if uh, they are not in possession of a, of a social security number, the ITIN is oftentimes the fallback. It's oftentimes, and if they're here legally, there's usually no problem with them having an ITIN or getting an ITIN. Mm -hmm. We have had instances, I've 
working, um, especially at Palomares, we, that's where a lot of our um, immigrant population from Latin America comes from. Uh, we have um, interpreters there and that sort of thing as well. Um, we've had some interesting cases there, uh, to be honest, and uh, especially the last couple of years, you want to make sure that it's a recent ITIN as well, because uh, they've been going through um, at Social Security Administration, and they've been uh, taking some of those ITINs out of circulation that have not been used uh, for a number of years. So make sure that it's an up-to-date ITIN as well, okay? Um, next, we are not allowed to engage in criminal, infamous, dishonest, notoriously disgraceful conduct or any conduct deemed to have a negative effect on VITA TCE. So, uh, no ragers for the next few months, you guys. Um, no, <laughs> no, uh, doing anything that's unbecoming. Um, we want to, uh, we want to you know, represent ourselves, represent the program as um, honest, professional, um, full of integrity, um, all those things you want in your tax preparer. Um, so I don't want to see your name in the um, police blotter or anything like that. Um, and yeah, just generally, you know, be good upstanding citizens who like to volunteer to do taxes for other people. <laughs> um, and finally, uh, treat all taxpayers in a professional, courteous, respectful manner. We have a set of rules in this country, uh, the U.S. Code. The U.S. Code currently um, tells us that any two uh, consenting adults can be married, to, um, regardless of gender or sex. Uh, that's one of the things that, you know, you've got some people out there who will refuse to um, acknowledge um, legal marriages like that. Uh, VITA is not the place for you. If you feel that way, VITA is not the place for you. Ultimately, we are here to, um, to serve the taxpayer, to serve our clients. Um, so we, we go by that U.S. code. We go by the, states of, um, the state laws of Illinois and Iowa. Um, and as far as all three of those entities are concerned, um, the, that's one of the big flashpoint ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, but you know, we've, we've got to treat everybody across the board exactly the same in a professional, um, courteous manner that is not unbecoming of United Way or VITA. Uh, are there any questions on anything like that? And gay marriage is just one of them that's very recently, you know, that wasn't the case for a while. And now we do have that where we do have gay marriage and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, it could be any number of issues. We just want to make sure that everybody is treated in the most professional manner possible. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, so <laughs> moving right along. Um, the other thing we do is we ensure that all of our people know what they need to know uh, to do the tax returns that are put in front of them. That being said, here is your gauntlet. Um, 76 or 6744. This is our um, this is our test, and you'll see it says test and retest. Okay. And what I like to do with this is I like to do the entire test on paper first. You know how I said we are allowed to ask each other any questions we want and make sure that we have the most accurate returns possible and um, all that sort of jazz. Um, this is an open book test. You can use, you can't call me and say, Sarah, what's the answer to question number one? I will not answer that. What I will say is, um, let's take for example, the advanced test, okay? If you guys open up to page 71, that is the beginning of the advanced test. Uh, and you'll say that's the uh, test questions. And then you'll see on page 109, the retest questions, okay? Advanced scenario with the test question number one, what is the most beneficial filing status for Rebecca? We talk about Rebecca as a scenario and then we ask questions about her. 
and you'll see single married filing joint head of house qualifying widower. On the retest, Rebecca's most beneficial allowed filing status is head of household. You can see how those two questions relate to each other, okay? So uh, what I'm suggesting is uh, answer all the questions on the test and retest on paper. And then uh, when you go online to take your test, because the test is all online, you get two chances to take it. And it will tell you which questions you got correct and which questions you got incorrect. And then, because you guys are all smart people, you can say, oh, well, if head of household didn't work because they asked me the retest question first, that's definitely not going to be my answer when I go back to retake it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it, it just provides a um, more complete picture um, and that sort of thing. And it helps you to, it's the same, when you go through your test online, you will get one of the question ones. You will get one of the question twos. It won't be the straight test or the straight retest. So just go through, answer all the questions, and then we can figure out through that first test, you know, where you might have um, gone astray and that sort of thing, and where we could come back and um, take a closer look at before you take that retest. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, okay. So yeah, that is one of my tricks of the trade from doing this for so many years. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, and we're going to go to, not that. We are going to go to lincolnlearncertification.com. This is the uh, an IRS website, specific data. Um, this is a website, I'm not, some people may have their logins from last year. If not, it's this linkslearncertification.com. And you can come down here and just create an account. And, um, you guys would be VITA volunteers. You would not probably want to take site coordinator certification, though if you have interest in sticking with the program and that sort of thing, we can definitely get you trained up to uh, help us on the back end too. Um, you're not an instructor. You guys are not territory managers. You guys do plan to volunteer with us. Your training source is going to be this Lincoln Learn Taxes and e-learning. And then you fill out your information here. Okay, and if you um, had a username last year, you can have it, um, you can reset your password and that sort of thing for it. And it'll keep track of how many years you were in and that sort of thing. And then it's going to have you fill out your address, your postal code, time zone. Partner organization is going to be Quad City United Way. Years you have volunteered. Um, if you guys are not like CPAs or CFPs or attorneys or that sort of thing, this professional status, you don't need to select anything there. If you have a P10 number, please put it in. Um, and then you just go and register, okay? Since I have already registered, I'm just going to log in. And then you will see this, okay? And what I suggest people do, if we look through the, um, the basic test, the basic test has 30 questions. The advanced test has 35 questions. I tell people to go for advanced because the biggest difference between the two of them is the fact that you are allowed to do 1099 R's on the advanced returns, but not on the basic returns. We have a lot of retirees and it's easier in the long run if you just answer those extra five questions and then uh, everybody's able to be at an advanced level and we are able to complete the returns um, as efficiently as possible within the people that we have at a site on any given night. So what I want you to do is come over to the advanced in a perfect world and then we're just gonna start going through the exam stuff. We've got volunteer standards of conduct. That's a lot of the stuff that I've just gone over. 
um, as far as like taking tips and any of that legal stuff and that sort of thing. We've got intake and quality review, which we will um, uh, keep going through. And then we've got our advanced exam, um, qualified experienced volunteers. You can take that if you've done this a while. After you get this stuff passed, they've got these certificates, which aren't worth the paper they're printed on. Um, I mean, they're nice if you want something to put up in your office or something like that. Yay, I, I completed some standards of conduct. That's not what we wanna see though, uh, to be perfectly honest. What we wanna see is uh, you get a score, you have to pass with at least 80%. You get two chances to take any test. And then over here, you sign your volunteer agreement and then click, uh, bah, 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 bah. open your agreement. All right, so this is the agreement that I need you guys to print out for us. This is the IRS generated um, report that says, we understand these standards of conduct as it pertains to VITA. This is all the stuff that I just went over out loud. And then this talks about, you know, you will be blacklisted if you break the rules and that sort of thing. Um, and it would ban future activity indefinitely. Deactivation of um, United Way's partnership with VITA. Um, termination of sponsoring or organizations partnership. Termination of grant funding. This is put on by grants. So the IRS gives United Way money to administer the program, to pay for the room rental fees, uh, that sort of thing. Um, all of that could be at jeopardy. Um, and then further along down here, it'll show you um, that, ooh, I need to change my address. That was my address last time. <laughs> um, so I need to update my address, but uh, this shows I'm a site coordinator, find a volunteer, um, and it shows, um, all of the different ones that I have passed, okay? My volunteer certification level. Your site coordinators are going to keep track of these. Please email this to Melissa, a uh, signed copy of it. And it will show us uh, if you are in basic, advanced, if you are, can do military or international returns, you can jump into that as well. Um, but this is the form that we need to show the IRS because we do have it where um, the IRS does uh, secret choppers and they will do audits of our systems and they will make sure that we are doing things in the way that we have been trained and the way that we um, are supposed to be uh, doing it. So uh, we get at least one of those audits every three years and it could be as simple as you know, Gretchen over there doesn't have her name tag on. Can you give it to her and make sure she puts it on? Or if it's something egregious, if you've got tip jars out or something like that, they could say, we're shutting the entire site down. We are retraining everybody. We are getting you back to where you need to be. Or they could shut us down completely with United Way and that sort of thing. So, um, what that agreement, what that form says is, you guys understand the rules, we're gonna stick in the parameters. You know, it's, it's bumper bowling. So we're giving you, we're giving you um, leeway to stay right in between those bumpers. We're not going to let you fall into the gutter. But that being said, you've got to work with us as well to make sure that all of those standards are being met and uh, kept at a very high uh, standard. Does that make sense to everybody? Are there any questions? I saw the chat was kind of lighting up. I think we've been handling the chat questions. One thing, um, Marianne uh, with AARP gave me a heads up on that. Vita for your first year, you know, saying if it's year zero or year one for your first year, there's a little bit of question on that. And she assured me that either one you put, it's not gonna break the system because there is debate whether you put zero or one, if it's your first year, just as long as you're not putting, you know, two years or more than that. Um, I'm not sure about the circular tooth question. 
Uh, Mary Ann, do you want to jump on or jump? I'm not real familiar with the circular 230 test either. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like with that, um, there were different, if you look within that, circular 230 professionals. I'm not sure if that's us. I'd rather see you guys just go to that basic or advanced tab and just work your way through all of those different um, different tests, okay? Sarah, <clears throat> Sarah this is Courtney. Uh, yeah. The C Circular 230 test is for people who are CPAs and attorneys oh. already. Okay. So, so if you already, and those are people who also tend to have a P10 already. Mm -hmm. um, so it, and the idea is that you qualify for circular 230 because you already have all kinds of ethical obligations um, based on your license. Um, so so it's it's a little bit, they skip over some of the stuff, some of the basic stuff um, because they assume you already know it uh, because of your license. So, um, so like, for example, my people who are lawyers and CPAs who help at my site, um, they'll take the circular 230 test okay. and it's, it's basically the equivalent of the advanced level. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so, so those, much for that clarification. Yeah. So those folks though, will not be eligible to do military or international unless they do those specific tests. It only okay. gets you the equivalent of advanced. Okay. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, so we can go in and let me see. Um, you can also go through and see, am I sharing screen again? I'm not sure. There we are. You can actually go through those volunteer standards of conduct course. You can review it then as a PDF and that sort of thing. There are different um, different resources available online and that sort of thing to make sure that we are able to answer all of those questions for you. Um, let me see, stop share. Where do I wanna go from here? Sorry. <laughs> um, all right. And just to interject while you're gathering your thoughts for the next portion, we are halfway through. So good job, everybody. You made it halfway. Yay. <laughs> Can I add something, Sarah? If yeah. Somebody has already taken or done the practice lab stuff and they go in to do the test. So that if they've done it two weeks ago, Mm -hmm. Go back in and relook at your practice lab to answer your test questions because some things have changed on it. So don't, oh yeah. So they, they now have about, did you receive your second stimulus check? Oh, um, that's true. So just be aware to go back and look. And as of when I took the test back, late December, on the advanced test number 17, they marked our answer as wrong. Oh, I think their answer is wrong because there were quite a few of us that all came up with the same answer. So if you take it, and I don't know if the answer is still in there as wrong or not, but don't be upset if they say it's six or 1646, something like that and you have 1787. So if they still say that answer is wrong, don't get upset about it. Because I think whoever did the test screwed up. And that <laughs> wasn't us. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, so where I want to start with you guys is um, we're going to pull up that 136.14c again. I'm going to share this one more time. Okay. Share screen. So this is the, again, that intake form that I keep going back to. It's our backbone. It's, um, yeah, it's the spine of this tax return, honestly. Everything's going to come back to what we have put on this. 
we are going to put um, the individual's first name on it, last name, phone number. We are going to uh, check that phone number probably 17 times while they're in there because Steve will attest to this. Uh, if we have problems on the back end and we do not have a good phone number, it is very, very, very difficult to, um, to get in contact with them. We've um, ended up having to uh, see if we've got emails on file for them. We have sent letters to them, certified letters. We have gone and knocked on people's doors to make sure that uh, these tax returns are done correctly and completely. Um, the easiest way to do this, uh, the safest way to do this, uh, especially with the pandemic and everything, make sure we have a good phone number for people. That is the a number one thing that um, if I if you don't learn anything else, we really need those phone numbers. <laughs> um, so we need to make sure that people's names are as they appear on their social security card. Some ladies after they get married might uh, wait a while to go down to social security and officially change their names. Uh, we need to know exactly how they are referred to by the government. The way we are going to figure that out is if they have their social security card with them. We need a good mailing address for them. Um, we prefer no PO boxes. Um, we need physical addresses for people. Uh, we need to figure out their citizenship status. Um, so US citizen, or if your spouse is a citizen, some of the um, refund or some of the economic stimulus payments and that sort of thing depended on um, your status as a US citizen or not. Um, we need mailing addresses, um, safe state zip, dates of birth, uh, job titles, we need to know if they're physically disabled, full-time student, legally blind. Uh, you can see full-time students going to open up that conversation of, well, who's paying for college? Are you paying any student loans? Do we have any student loan interest we could deduct from your income and that sort of thing? Uh, can anyone claim you or your spouse as a dependent? That could get into some interesting territory as well. Generally, no, uh, but sometimes we have breadwinner households where we have um, adults who do not work for whatever reason. And especially with this economy, you know, some people who may have been able to uh, claim themselves before are no longer allowed to claim themselves. Uh, have you, your spouse or dependents been victims of a tax related uh, identity theft or been issued an identity protection pin? People will know if their information was stolen people may not know where that letter is. Uh, if we do not have that letter, we would not be able to complete the tax return. They would not be able to get their refunds. Um, so we need to know whether or not that happened. And from that, we can press further and figure out if they have that letter and um, what they've done with it and that sort of thing. As of December 31st, 2020, what was your marital status? Never married. That includes registered domestic partnerships, civil unions, or other formal relationships under state law, not federal law. People in a civil union are not married. Um, and then we've got married. Yes, did you get married in 2020? Did you live with your spouse during, during any of the last six months? Um, or did you get married? Oh, and then under here, divorced. Date of final decree. You may be surprised how many people do not go and complete their paperwork. Um, my mother left my dad when I was about eight years old. She did not formally divorce him until a week and a half before her next marriage. Uh, they were still married in the eyes of the United States government, in the eyes of the Illinois government. Um, and as such, they could either do married filing separately or married filing joint. Uh, we need to know that people have severed that legal tie with that person before they are um, claiming that they are single. Like, sure, they could be single, but they are still married in the eyes of the government if they have not 
finalized that divorce. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Let me stop sharing for a minute, see you guys again. Do I see nods, head nods? <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, let me go back to sharing. Um, All right, moving right, right along. Legally separated. Again, that means that you are not single yet. That means you are still married filing separately, okay? Le uh, married filing separately as well. Uh, they should be able to come up with their uh, spouses or former spouses' social security number if they're doing married filing separately. We will still need to do that because they do want to match those returns to make sure that um, things are on the up and up between the two returns and that they're not, you know, trying to get away with anything. Widowed, uh, year of spouse's death. The reason that's important is, uh, the, let's say my husband, who I love dearly, um, passed away. Okay. I've got the four kids. Um, this year, so let's say, let's say he died Christmas Eve. Okay. This year, I can still say married filing joint, which means I get the married filing joint standard deduction. I get um, all of those benefits that are afforded to um, married filing joint people. Uh, next year, next two years, I can do uh, widowed as my um, status, where I believe I get the head of household um, standard deduction. Uh, so that's higher than a single person's, uh, or no, I said that wrong, didn't I? Do I still get the married filing joint standard deduction then with widowed? Oh, you're on mute, John. <laughs> you can still get that equivalent if you have a dependent child, but you have to have a child in your there household it is. to do it. Yep. So it's still married filing joint. So I get that married filing joint benefit for the next two years because I've still got the kids in the household and that sort of thing. Um, I get to consider myself widowed and that sort of thing. And hopefully by that time, you know, um, after a couple of years, we can, the kids start to age out or you might get involved in a new relationship or something like that. So that widowed status counts if you have minor children and uh, the spouse has died within the last two years. Next, list the names below of everyone who lived with you other than your spouse, anyone you supported but did not live with you. Uh, and then we're going to go through these people and find out their names, date of birth to figure out, you know, the age of them, that sort of thing, relationship to you, number of months they lived in your home, U.S. citizen, single or married, full-time student, totally disabled, and then what we're going to ask them, is this person a qualifying ch child or relative of anybody else? If we flip in our 4012s now to dependents, tab C, we have awesome uh, flow charts and that sort of thing. Um, maybe I've got pulled up, I do. C3, said C. So dependents, we've got these awesome flow charts here to figure out if they're a qualifying child or a qualifying relative. Like let's say my mother-in-law comes and uh, lives with us. Um, we have to go through and make sure their gross income and that sort of thing. We answer all sorts of questions about them and we've got these different flow charts to figure out if they actually are legally allowed to be on your return or not, okay? One place um, where we have some contention sometimes is with uh, divorced individuals who have custody of a child. Uh, generally, the rule is uh, living with one parent more than a year, and you can't say that there's 50-50 division because we've got 365 days in a year. Which person did they spend more nights at their house is how we determine that. 
Um, and then we go through it and like we've seen divorce decrees and that sort of thing and you know who gets what and that. Uh, so if when in doubt, please ask questions. Um, and then, yeah, sorry, I got off my train of thought again. Share screen again, go back to where I was. All right, so then we're going to go through here. And another thing I wanna point out to you guys, this yes, no, unsure. Wages, salaries, and this form is going to tell us that's going to be a W-2 you're gonna look for. Yes, how many jobs did you have? Tip income. Uh, you'll see also we've got B's and A's and M going down through this return. What these letters are, B is for basic, A is for advanced, okay? If somebody has cash, in, cash tip income, that person needs to be advanced to uh, complete that return, the first person who does the return before the quality reviewer. Can see basic can do a lot of stuff but not all of it advanced can do a lot more so again i am um asking you guys if you're able to um you know the advanced test is not that much harder than the basic test so if you're able to if you're confident enough please take that advanced test so we can get as many people as we can in an, at an advanced level so that we can uh, complete those returns uh, so we're going to go through wages and salary, tip income, scholarships. The interesting thing about scholarships, um, we've got a lot of people who have education credits and that sort of thing, and they will um, want to have those education credits. So we'll get this form called a 1098T, and it will show us the amount of scholarships somebody got, the amount that they paid the school. And we need to figure out if they paid more money to the school or if they got more scholarships than they paid out. If they got more scholarships than they paid out. That's counted as income um, in the, in the uh, IRS tax code. Refund to state and local taxes. Um, I see this more in Iowa than Illinois uh, that you will have that 1099G. Alimony income or separate maintenance payments. <laughs> Trust me, people will know if they're paying alimony. People will know if they're paying um, uh, uh, child support. Um, alimony, how does that work? Alimony is considered income and the person paying it out. Um, I know until last year, I'm not sure if they changed the rule, but they were allowed, um, the person paying it out was allowed to deduct it from their income. Uh, does anybody have any update on that or anything like that? I Okay. Um, but yeah, up until, well, it, it should be that it's still the same like that. John, did you have anything to add to that? Well, the only thing I was going to say is a lot of people get confused between alimony and child support. Mm -hmm. Alimony as you said in previous years we could they could deduct it from their income child support they can so if they're paying child support and they a lot of them will swear that it's not child support this is alimony if it's classified as child support no matter how much they argue it's still classified as child support and they can't deduct it if it is alimony it was deductible in the past i haven't looked or researched this year as to whether or not that's changed. There was a clarification from irs.gov. Um, alimony or separate maintenance payments are not deductible from income of the payer spouse or includable in the income of the receiving spouse if made under divorce or separation agreement executed um, after December 31st, 2018. So within the last two years, then that is not the case anymore. I apologize for that. I felt like there had been a rule change there. I, I just wanted to look it up. And um, the entire tax code is voluminous, um, but every single thing you could possibly ever want to know about taxes is published on the IRS website. That being said, you don't need to 
read the entire tax code. <laughs> Generally speaking, most stuff falls within, uh, you know, fairly, yeah, you know, it falls within our bumpers on that bowling alley we were talking about earlier. Um, so, and if anything involves further research and that sort of thing, that usually gets kicked up to myself, John, uh, Steve, Perlene, uh, Allison, etc. So, uh, when in doubt, ask. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to share screen again. Do you guys like this where I'm sharing the screen and going through it with you so you can see it? Okay. Self employment income. Um, again, that's an advanced person, Form 1099 miscellaneous, uh, cash, virtual currency, that's Bitcoin and that sort of thing, other properties or services. Self employment income, you're going to have your Uber stuff there, your Lyft stuff there, any of the Pampered Chef or the uh, any of those multi-level marketing. So you've got your oils and uh, you've got, who else? Sensi, uh, Tupperware people, that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, sometimes the conversation evolves into, I only made how much or I... I lost how much <laughs> um, with the self-employment income. If you have a business that does not turn a profit for three years, it is in fact not a business, it's a hobby and it cannot be counted in taxes. <laughs> um, so what we need to do is, uh, you know, figure out exactly what those expenses are, exactly what that income is, and figure out if that is a viable path uh, with that person. We are not trained as um, financial counselors, <laughs> but um, yeah, it it can put it into stark perspective when you figure out black and white is exactly what those expenses are compared to that income. If it is a um, profitable thing that they're doing. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, cash check, virtual currency payments or other property or services for work performed um, not on a W-2 or 1099. I'm not sure if I have encountered virtual currency in VITA. Um, does anybody else, any of the other, uh, anybody else, Allison's shaking her head no. John say no. So we really have not seen that. So don't expect it. Um, plus, the, plus that's out of scope anyway. Yeah. So, and then back to where you were talking about a business loss. If you, when you do a tax return and there's a business loss that becomes out of scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that, Allison. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's true. Um, income or loss from the sale of or exchange of stocks, bonds, virtual currency, or real estate, including your home. Uh, so what we do, uh, generally, if you're going to a bigger home, if you buy a bigger home, it's fine. You are allowed one time in your life to downsize your house. Um, so, and some people will get some... Um, um income from that we have not generally seen those because if you're at the point where you have a nice big fat cushy house and you are selling it um those people generally don't make our average of twenty thousand dollars a year uh so we're not probably going to see that uh on the vita side what we will see though is um stocks bonds and that sort of thing and we have <laughs> Uh, stocks and bonds can be rather uh, cumbersome uh, because they want you to list out, you know, every single transaction. So if you've got people who have some of those stash accounts or the Robinhood accounts and that sort of thing, they are fine until they start selling that stock again. And what it'll do is they will go through and they will ask what that sale price is and what the, um, or what what they bought the stock for what versus what they sold it for. And then we will figure out what that income is um, for each of those stocks and bonds and that sort of thing. Um, retirement income from pensions, annuities, IRAs. Again, this is one that is on the advanced test. Um, this is why I ask people to uh, take that advanced test. 
you're going to look at the 1099R or the W-2 and they're going to look basically the same. They've got, they've got a federal ID number, they've got an employer number or a, where the pension is from. They've got your total income, your taxable income, the taxes that were taken out. I mean, tit for tat, they are very, those documents are very close to each other. Um, I'm not, well, there are a couple of reasons why um, retirement income is on the advance, but you know, 99% of the time it is put in as easily as a W-2 is. And um, we've got a lot of retirees that use our services and that sort of thing. So that is something that we really want to um, make sure we are able to uh, service our clients with those, um, with those documents. Unemployment com compensation, I am anticipating seeing a lot of unemployment compensation this year, simply with the pandemic and the unemployment and all that sort of thing. Um, if we have unemployed people, I hope, um, but I, uh, I hope they've taken out taxes, but I am a realist. <laughs> um, so if, if you've got people who are taking out unemployment, you know, they're scraping by but that being said, it is counted as income according to the IRS. And um, as such, it will be uh, factored in to, um, to their total income for the year. So hopefully they've got some taxes taken out to cover that. Social Security Railroad Retirement Benefits. We've got one family I can think of that does the Railroad Retirement Benefits. And... Um, so a majority of these that you will see is uh, the social security, that SSA 1099. It's going to be a red and white um, fold out statement from the social security administration. It's fairly easy to follow. Um, it shows the person's income, their, uh, what they've given to Medicare and the, that sort of thing, what they've paid in for Medicare and also the taxes that they've had taken out. Not everybody takes taxes out if you do not have any extra pension income or that sort of thing, your benefits are not taxable, but if you make over a certain amount, um, your benefits can be taxable up to 85%. So let's say I make $10,000 uh, this year on social security, but I also had some other income, up to 8,500 of that could be considered taxable income um, after the, um, uh, tax reform from 1986. Income or loss from rental property. If you have rental property, um, just across the board, we really don't look at rental properties at FIDA. Um, you'll see that military people can do it. What happens there is uh, some of our military members uh, will go abroad, uh, go out on tours, and they will rent their house out while they are gone. And that is why rental income gets pushed into that military um, accreditation. If you wanna get um, certified in military or uh, HSA or international, you are more than welcome to do it. Please let us know. Um, so if we do have any questions on that sort of thing, we may uh, tap into you, but generally speaking across the board, we, Quasi United Way, BIDA does not do rental income properties. And then other income, gambling, lotteries, prizes. Um, I, I donated 20 bucks a couple of years ago to Junior Achievement and um, in Moline, and I ended up winning their $1,000 grand prize. <laughs> so I had to um, declare that on my income because that was considered taxable income. Um, jury duty, um, Schedule K-1s. I have not seen a K-1 in VITA in all of my years. K-1s are um, ownership and interest in that sort of thing, royalties. Um, if you have like a book that you sold, um, that sort of thing. Uh, foreign income, occasionally, very occasionally, I will see um, something from Canada or something like that. Does anybody else wanna shed light on that? I don't think that's something that we're really going to deal with like at all. So, John, you're on mute. John, you're still on mute. <laughs> I don't know how I keep getting on mute. 
but you might see that the foreign income with your stocks and bonds, but the, the bonds are, are some of the more the stocks and the bonds, but some of those have income offshore. Mm -hmm. And you might see a, a tripling of foreign income when you look through those. Oh, that's true. And we'll show you when you get your first stock or bond statement, you'll look at it and go, um, and then you will nicely call one of us over and we will help you with that. And we will show you where that foreign income could potentially be on that, um, on that um, statement. Because some of those statements, the shortest one I've seen is like five or six pages and they could go up to like 20 pages. And a lot of it is just a bunch of blank space. Uh, so, but that is that portion of it. So we've gotten through income. <laughs> And then um, we're going to talk about expenses. Um, so alimony, we've talked about already. We do uh, need those social security numbers if we've got them. If not, what happens is we end up filing a paper return. Contributions to a retirement account. All right, so the way retirement income works is I work uh, for my job 12 months a year at the Botanical Center. We have simple plans, we have, which is kind of like a 401k, if you've heard of that. If you give money to a 401k, a traditional plan, it is taken off of your income and you will notice on your W-2 that your wages for the year are going to be less than your social security wages. So your wages in box one is what the IRS goes by for your income it's going to be less because you give those dollars, um, it's, it's beneficial to you to contribute to your traditional IRAs. If you have a Roth account, what happens is that money is contributed to your retirement account after taxes have been taken out. But the kickback is you are allowed to have that money grow until you are 59 and a half years old. And then when you go to pull it out on the other end, it is tax free. When we take out our traditional IRAs and 401ks and that sort of thing, uh, we get the tax benefit when we are contributing to it, but then it is considered regular income when you go to pull it out in 20, 30, 40 years. Does everybody, um, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and just check in with everybody and look at eyes. Do, does that make sense to everybody in a nutshell? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, screen share. College. Um, uh, so then we're going to ask them, contrib contributions to the retirement account, what kind of retirement account is it? Um, and they may not know. Uh, if, uh, you know, on some of the apps now, they've got it where you can very specifically open a Roth IRA and you can have a regular stock account and you can have a retirement account on there. And uh, they will track that information for you and that sort of thing. And a lot of people, you'd be surprised how fast people can bring things up on their phones. <laughs> um, contributions to post-secondary education for yourself, spouse, or dependents. Form 1098-T. So what we're going to do with that, publication 4012, and we're going to go down to education credits. looking for J. So if I was in an actual classroom with you, I would be doing this exact the same thing, flipping through my book. I use that 4012. It's with me. It'll be in my bag for the next three or four months because it's got so much information and all sorts of flow charts for you and that sort of thing. It's not going to steer you wrong. Here's what I'm looking for. All right. Educational tax benefits. So we've got uh, all sorts of education um, things that could be interesting on the um, different tax, um, tax forms. We've got our scholarships, grants, tuition. Um, 
we and then it this is this is where the ring is for the binder <laughs> So you can see this whole chart in front of you, but we've got the American Opportunity Credit, we've got Lifetime Learning Credit, Student Loan Interest Deduction. People will know if they paid student loan interest, and this year it's going to be a lot lower probably than in uh, prior years because we only had, for most loans, like anything serviced by like Navient, Sally Mae, etc., um, Great Lakes, um, the student loan interest, uh, they had a moratorium on that when they passed the CARES Act in March. So you're, most people are only going to have three months worth of student loan interest that they are going to deduct. Um, and then these, I'm not seeing these hardly at all. The big ones here are gonna be that American Opportunity Credit, Lifetime Learning Credit, Tuition and Fees Deductions. Um, and we will be able to go through those with you as you see them. Um, and Marianne, especially tomorrow, is going to do a um, big tax problem with you guys. Um, so like a tax client coming in, it's going to kind of look like our test book where it's going to have all of the documents and that sort of thing that, and then an interview with the person. So she will go through that with you and show you how to input that into Tax Slayer. Um, child or dependent care expenses such as daycare, people generally will know that they have those expenses. If you have somebody who's sending their kids to the Y care or to um, um, skip along or to places like that, they will issue one of these statements that says, skip along at 60th Street and Moline with the federal ID number of XYZ for, you know, Elijah James, um, his mother uh, spent $3,200. And we will, what that uh, information needs to have on it is the child care provider's name, address, uh, federal ID number, the child's name, how much money was spent per child. So let's say you've got one kid who has full-time care in a nursery classroom and three-year-old class. And then you've got one kid who only comes in for after-school stuff or was only there for summer stuff or something like that. We need to have that breakdown per child of, um, of um, child care. And we need to know that that child was in child care in order for the parents to work. That is how uh, dependent care expenses can be deducted um, as, a, as a credit. Uh, for supplies used as an edu ed eligible educator, such as a teacher, teacher's aide, counselor, I promise you every single teacher will know about this rule. <laughs> uh, you are allowed to de deduct up to $250 of money that you spend out of pocket for your classroom. Uh, so they will know that they will have their expenses and that sort of thing. Student loan interest, I just talked about that. Um, expenses related to self-employment income or other income you've received. People who have their own businesses generally will have those expenses as well. HSA. Um, um, John, do you, I forget if, you know, uh, the credit card mortgage, the cancellation of debt. What is the rule on it? We are allowed to do credit card debt that's been canceled, correct? But not, but not the homes. Uh, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, mortgage cancellation of or foreclosure of a home gets complicated real quick. There's very little that we're qualified or we're allowed to do. Most of it is out of scope. Yeah. And generally, if you see that on your thing, that's going to be a big red flag. Just call one of us over. Um, and we'll probably err on the side of not doing it. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> cancellation of debt, if you, the way that works is if you have somebody, and we might have a lot more of that this year, just given the circumstances and the economy and all that sort of thing. Um, cancellation of debt is if 
you know, that Capital One account goes into collections. The collection guy calls and says, all right, you owe $1,500, but we'll settle it for $1,200. That $300 is considered taxable income. Uh, so uh, we, yeah, that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, one way or another, the government is going to get theirs. <laughs> um, adopt a child. Can, yeah, go ahead, John. Interrupt. Oh, yes, please. I need a drink. <laughs> You're going to get a lot of taxpayers when they, who have cancellation of debt, when you tell them they have income, they're going to look at you like you have three eyes and go, what do you mean I have income? I never saw any of that money. It doesn't matter to the IRS if they saw the money or not. The debt was forgiven. So that money that was forgiven that they don't have to pay back is what they consider income. Because you spent that three hundred dollars on a TV or something, and you don't have to give that back. It's it's income. Yep. All righty. <laughs> have earned income credit, child tax credit, or American Opportunity credit disallowed in a prior year? Um, they will know if that's happened. What happens there is if somebody fraudulently says. I have this child that I'm taking care of, or I make X amount of dollars. The way the uh, child tax, or the way the, um, let me do that for a second. Um, the way the earned income credit works um, is it, yeah, here we go. Um, share my screen again, is what happens is if you make no money, you do not get this credit. Earned is the first letter in this acronym, right? So if you earn money, they say, we understand it is hard as when you have kids to make ends meet. So we are going to help you out. If you are one of the poorer people, and you'll look at this earnings. Again, the average income of our families is $20,000. So you'll see that on that $20,000 line, there's a lot of earned income credit to be had. Um, we will reward you for working, okay? But you get to a point where they say, all right, well, you're making enough to start making it on your own. And it starts phasing out again, okay? So you got some people, not all people, there is always one bad apple in the bunch. Um, not every single person is out to defraud the IRS, right? But there are those people out there who will say, oh yeah, I totally made X amount of dollars as a waitress, um, you know, in cash tips, trying to maximize that refund. Uh, the IRS catches wind of that sort of thing and it turns into this fraud thing and then they're not allowed to get those credits anymore. They will know if they've tried to defraud the government. <laughs> um, so that is how that portion works. Um, am I still sharing my screen? Nope. Okay. Uh, let me get back to it then. That's the wrong one. All right. Purchase and install energy efficient home items like windows, furnaces, installation. Uh, they've become a little stingier with that sort of stuff. And people will say, well, I got, you know, a new roof or something like that. A lot of that stuff doesn't count anymore. Um, the big things that uh, help are energy efficient windows, uh, geothermal, if somebody got solar panels, but that stuff is a boatload of money. And generally, uh, we're not going to see as much of that. We did when I was very first starting, but they've really become kind of stringent with that stuff. Received the first time home buyer's credit in 2008. What that was, was in 2008, um, they were going to give a credit to people to help them with the down payment on their home. And then the financial crisis in 2008 hit. And so, very specifically in 2008, if you got that, you have to pay it back over the course of a number of years. And so 
people will know if they bought a house in 2008, people will know that they've been paying it back for a number of years and people will have that paperwork with them. Um, most of our people are trained to bring in last year's tax return, which is really, really nice because then we're able to compare apples to apples and figure out if there's any big discrepancies from year to year. And so you'll be able to see that on their tax return if they have been making those payments and that sort of thing. Um, make estimated tax payments or apply last year's refund to this taxes. Some people um, make quarterly payments to the IRS. Um, I have one gentleman who has about eight different sources of like little pensions here and there and that sort of thing. And um, between that and his social security, he ends up owing like $3,000 a year. And so I told him uh, that he could either increase what they're taking out on one of his pensions or his social security, or he could start paying in quarterly installments. Because if, when push comes to shove, when the entire tax return is done, if you owe more than $1,000, the IRS is going to be grumpy. Um, they are going, and generally, we're not going to have very many instances of this. Generally, we have people with a W-2 and their payroll department has been taking out taxes the entire year. And they, um, they are filing their quarterly tax statements and that sort of thing. So the IRS has money coming in the entire year. Um, they like that, they appreciate that, they want to be within $100 of you, um, you know, one way or another. Um, a lot of people, you know, would rather have that sort of thing. If they end up owing you thousands of dollars, that's fine. You've paid into the system the entire time. They've been kind of allowed to use your money tax-free or interest-free, and then they just send you, you know, issue you a refund check. If you owe them, though, they get a little less happy. And so what they're going to do is they're going to go back and when did you actually earn that income and uh, that sort of thing. I actually have a private client of mine. She called me up the week of Thanksgiving and uh, she said, I'm not allowed to call my parents, but they said I could call my tax accountant. Theoretically, if I was on a game show and I won six figures, what needs to happen? <laughs> And um, so she ended up being on the, um, on the Christmas Eve show for Price is Right and won a Porsche, and, which was awesome for her. <laughs> but she still doesn't have her Porsche uh, because uh, she um, needs to write them a check for $20,000 when push comes to shove. And um, yeah, roughly you know, 20% of that income because the retail value of that car was considered income. And um, just, it was weird with it being the end of the year and that sort of thing. But um, they wanna see that the taxes were paid at the taxable event. So she cannot take that Porsche, drive it around for a year, and then at the end of the year say, oh yeah, that's right, I owe you guys. Um, that does not fly in the eyes of the IRS. <laughs> so you'll notice uh, with all of your, if you guys get bonus checks or anything like that from work, a big chunk of it is taken out for taxes. What they do with that is they assume that you're, it's bumping you into that next tax bracket. So, because, you know, your W-2, generally speaking, is going to stay pretty even Steven throughout the year. But if you have these big taxable events, that's when you're going to need to take that big chunk out and make sure that the government gets their, you know, portion of it um, so that everybody is covered because they want to make sure that, you know, you don't have to pay interest and that sort of thing on top of that stuff. So if I can say anything to you as a taxpayer, make sure when you have those taxable events, pay those taxes. <laughs> um, Filed a federal return containing a capital loss carryover on Schedule D. I don't think I've ever seen that on VITA. Has John, Allison, Perlene, have you guys seen anything like that? I've seen it a couple of times at the, uh, yeah, the friendly house. Okay. So occasionally it'll happen, but just call one of us over and we'll be able to steer you in the right direction there. 
um, have health care coverage through the marketplace exchange, <laughs> provide form 1095A. So, oh, 15 minutes left. All right. The Affordable Care Act, uh, colloquially known as Obamacare, was passed in 2009. Um, what happened with that was exchanges were made on the state level whereby if you did not have a group insurance rate through your employer, you could go on to these state um, exchanges and you could get a, um, a health insurance plan. Depending on what you made, that money, uh, that could be subsidized further. Um, so what they're talking about with that 1095A is they want you to figure out your income, how much you should be paying for a plan, how much you're actually owing for that plan. And then um, it's that reconciliation of whether or not you may or may not um, be owed a refund or you actually have to pay in and um, pay back that subsidy. So let's say that I started the year and I made $30,000 and I had to pay for my plan on the Illinois exchange. I lost my job in March when the pandem pandemic hit, okay? From there, if I was still paying for that plan, I might actually be owed a refund because they would be, you know, instead of a $30,000 job, I only made $8,000 this year or something like that. I qualified for Medicare. So any of that money I used or I spent on um, health insurance, I would get refunded to me. Let's say on the other end of the spectrum, I went into the state exchange and I said, I'm going to make $30,000 this year. And then I got a sweet um, promotion uh, three months into the year. So I'm actually making $70,000. Okay but I'm still paying that subsidized rate of insurance. I, as a $70,000 income level, I should not be have my health insurance be subsidized. So I need to pay that subsidy back to the government. That's what that form 1095A is, share screen, that they reference right here. We need to be able to see that 1095A to figure out how much that health insurance costs, how much was actually paid by the insured person. And then we need to be able to do that reconciliation because it asks you at the beginning of the year, how much you expect to make that year. And then this is just going to reconcile it back to that number. Received an economic Im impact payment or stimulus in 2020. Um, So if we go to our tax form this year, this just says it's in draft form, not for filing yet, but this is what it's going to look like. Um, we are going to, remember how they said it was going to run through your taxes and this sort of thing? This is what we're talking about. A lot of people did not get the first stimulus. A lot of people did not get the second stimulus. So what they said is, okay, that's, that's all fine and dandy. We're going to run it through the tax return to make sure people are going to get the money that is owed to them. And where we see that rebate recovery credit is this line, ah, gosh darn it, sorry. It's that line 30 right there, okay? So what that does is, again, you know, it talked about in the uh, CARES Act, if you made, um, if you made less than $100,000, you could get the payment, right? So what happens if um, the person, um, you know, the person did not get their refund payment and they were within the income requirements? Well, then they can say on that refund uh, recovery, you know, this is what I should have gotten this is what I actually got. You guys owe me money. Um, my friend had a baby uh, in January of last year. She technically should have gotten that extra $500 for a dependent, but that dependent was not listed on our, 20, 
on her taxes last year. So the government was not aware of that child. So, you know, she and her husband got $1,200. They should have gotten 17. You guys owe me 500 bucks. Um, or, you know, it could go the other way too. Um, you know, I actually made more money than I thought I was going to. And so I, you know, I'm part of that phase out portion of it. So again, that's another little hiccup for this year that, um, you know, we'll be able to get through it with flying colors because we're going to see it 20 times a night. <laughs> so um, it, all of this stuff, it's just little, they're puzzle pieces. We're trying to build this puzzle. We're trying to create that entire image of what your tax life looked like in 2020. Um, my throat's starting to get sore. I haven't talked for <laughs> two hours <laughs> in a while. Um, so then we go down here, provide an email address. It, it's optional, uh, presidential election campaign fund. So the federal government gives the Democrats and the Republicans X amount of dollars a piece uh, during each election. So that is not endorsing any one candidate, that is not endorsing any one president, but it is also just free money that could otherwise go into your pocket. Um, I don't think I've ever seen anybody want to give to the presidential election campaign fund. Um, and then it talks about if you are due a refund, what would you like? Direct deposit, savings bonds, um, or display your refund between different accounts. I really don't want to see people splitting it between accounts. We've talked about this, um, direct deposit. Everybody gets, everybody gets their own deposit. Everybody gets their own money. Um, if kids don't have bank accounts, trust me, every single, um, oh stop. Every single uh, financial institution in the Quad Cities is willing to open up kids' accounts. Um, this kid right here has her own account. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cora. I <laughs> Lovely. Got, I just got back from hockey. And a little, you know. You didn't have to hitchhike? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, but we do want to make sure that those people uh, know their bank account numbers. Um, when we enter them into the system, you want to make sure you're using a person's check. Um, the way... The way these work is um, the bottom line of a check is called a micro number. It used to be magnetic ink that they could fly through the machines and it could sort them out and figure out the money and that sort of thing. Now we just use it for that routing and account number. And then um, at the end of the account number is going to be the check number. So that's your micro number um, all um, laid out in black and white for you. If you look at uh, Catch Me If You Can, um, if you watch Catch Me If You Can, they kind of talk about that a little bit on there. Uh, he does a lot of like check kiting and that sort of thing in that movie. But that number is essentially the address to your bank account. So there's going to be a portion of it at the beginning. It's nine numbers. That's your routing number. That's going to be which financial institution you're at. And like with the national banks, US Bank, Wells Fargo, that sort of thing, um, your routing number is dependent on where, which state you account in, um, because they are such big banks, they are nationwide, uh, they want to put it into that one place where you are actually from. Um, so we want to make sure we're copying it off of the, that check so that we've got that accurate routing number and we've got the accurate account number as well. Um, it is not the debit card number. It is um, completely different from that. Um, let's state the stimulus. Oh, I didn't realize that. Um, so I'm, I'm just reading the comments now um, in the chat and they're talking about um, people might have received a letter talking about that stimulus payment and what they should have gotten versus what they actually got and that sort of thing. They just wanna, oh, and the IRS is not going to ask for money back. So that's kind of nice. <laughs> I know that I had a friend who, um, very nice lady and her, her father passed away and she got a check and she's like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? 
<laughs> and uh, so she ended up shredding it because he was not with us anymore. And um, so she didn't want to defraud the government. <laughs> um, so volunteers will not be face to face with clients. Okay. Um, any other questions anybody can think of at this point? Anybody at all? Melissa. <laughs> I just want to thank Sarah for talking for two hours. That was a long presentation and I don't think anyone fell asleep. I think it was great. You did a great job sharing the screen and asking for questions throughout. Um, so everyone, please thank Sarah. She did it all tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the practice lab, how do we use it? So tomorrow, uh, yes, Marianne, I did finish and take an interview for you. Um, tomorrow, Marianne, who is in the chat, is actually going to be doing a practice problem with you guys in the practice lab. So we will be able to see how to log into that. And um, Melissa sent out the uh, information on the tax layer on getting to that practice lab so that uh, people can go in there and they can, you can actually take this test book and um, do these tax problems that are in here, the different scenarios and that sort of thing. Um, they've got, Marianne, I told them how to get in to um, do your certification tests and that sort of thing, but not tax slayer yet. So are they going to be able to log in with that general um, password to get into the practice lab then? They should be able to. Um, yeah. And then Marianne. I sent those instructions out a couple of times. Okay. It was a reminder today. So when you go to that website, it's the top left. Um, it's the practice lab. You click on that top left box and then that prompts you for only a password. So you enter only that password in there and then you can set up your own account with a username and a password. So there's a couple there of go. steps um, in that. And then Marianne sent me some documents that I'll be forwarding on to you tomorrow. So you can look at those ahead of time, print them or have them on your screen for tomorrow night when she's going through that training. So I'll be sending those tomorrow. Perfect. Uh, so that is, yeah, there was nothing else really on there. Um, so that's, you guys should be able to do now the code of conduct. You should be able to do the intake and interview form because Lord knows you guys know that back front and upside down now. <laughs> uh, one thing I did want to show you guys on the very back, the last thing I play with is uh, Federal disclosure, content to disclose tax return information to our sites. Uh, basically what this says, um, oh, Global Carry Forward Assist, if you visit a different site next year. Um, what we tell them, we, we tell them to sign this thing. So the um, quality reviewer will go through their tax return with them after you fill out the tax return with them, right? And um, we will go through it line by line with them and show them exactly what is on their return. And then it says to disclose this tax return information um, and enter a PIN number. So what it says is we have prepared this return as accurately as possible based on the information that they give us, but ultimately they as the taxpayer are the ones that are responsible for that information and their signature and their PIN number are what is on that tax form, okay? bringing it around full circle. Again, if you stay within our bumpers and our lane for uh, this bowling alley that we're on, you guys will not fall into the gutter. Follow the rules, follow um, what you are certified to do and you will not go wrong, okay? I hope this made people feel a little bit better about that and that sort of thing and ready to step into that role as tax preparers <laughs> with us. Well, thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I really miss you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow night at 530. If you need anything, I'm an email or a phone call away. Again, I'll email 
um, documents tomorrow, uh, just to help you along with tomorrow night's um, meeting. <coughs> and we appreciate you being on here and devoting your time to this great cause. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you, you guys. Goodbye. We'll see you later. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi, Cora. Bye. <laughs>